Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Hi, guys. Hello. Happy Monday afternoon. Yes. You know, this has been a tough one. I don't know what's up with it, but it feels, this week, this week feels weird to me. The last, uh, people are out and about, like, too many people. Yeah. I hit traffic this weekend for the first time in 10 weeks. I, I drove the car this morning for the first time since March 6th, I think. I, I did you feel I was guilty like, about it or did you like how well, first did you I, had feel? To, I had to top off the battery because I, I forgot to start one of them for a, a you know let's say a month and it didn't right. it cranked a little slower than I liked so I just oh, put the oh, charger on oh. it yeah um but then after it was it was going I was like well let's go for a drive and see what it's like out in the world and and my daughter and I piled in the car and we drove around town for a little bit and checked out familiar places she's like Dad, it feels like we're going really fast. It was like we're going 22 miles an hour, sweetheart. This is fine. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we hit a little bit of actual traffic, which felt like, to be honest, San Francisco this last, we've been doing a lot of driving around town, right? We've been getting some stuff from Jane the Bakery over on Geary Street, and uh, we take the dog over to uh, a couple of the meadows at Golden Gate Park. Um, and you know, the whole city's felt like the weekend that Burning Man happens. Empty. Right? It, like, yeah. yeah, just unpopulated. And it's been delightful to be able to move through the city that way. And uh, to be honest, I there was a little bit of sadness for me this weekend when we were on 101 and we hit some traffic. Wow. So we went up north, right? We went up to, yeah, we went up and drove up to Napa and drove around and had uh, did some takeout at a Mexican place up there. It was delightful. And Maggie got to run around. I mean, that's, I feel like that, a perfect trip to do, right? It's, it's to, if you want to get, feel like you're going to, you're stuck in the house, a little cabin fever. You don't need to make like a weekend trip out of it. Just a long drive, a 45 minute drive somewhere to do yeah. extended takeout, right? And just to look outside is so helpful. And, something different. Yeah, and to be honest, we took a different route than we normally do to Napa. We went uh, East Bay, Bay Bridge, Carquinas Bridge, 37 to 29 and up. Uh, and then we took the uh, the Silverado Trail back south through Napa. Um, again, neither of these were routes we had taken. And so there's a way in which a new route sort of occupies a new part of your brain and feels like something novel is happening. It's really quite quite lovely we, we all felt re- very refreshed and did you check out that incredible shot julia took of me and maggie yeah. it was really yeah. good back Just lit with the sun yeah you guys in the shadow we'll put it in, in the link yeah to your tweet um in the description but it's i i definitely because i've done a lot of takeout on on the regular but notice they feel like it feels like even looking out the window more people going on runs, more people. And it's like 50-50, I think, at least in San Francisco, people wearing masks, at least in this neighborhood, and some not wearing masks. Uh, We we could, like, drives me, everyone needs to wear masks. It's just making me, I go outdoors just to get annoyed at people. And and, (laughs) it's funny, that's why I stopped going out, (laughs) because I see the people not wearing masks. And, like, the the sidewalks here are so crowded now because people are out walking and biking and, and skateboarding and stuff that you can't, like, like. I live in Pacifica, which is a beach town, and I live about a mile from the beach, and they, the county shut down all the beach parking lot, and then the city has blocked off all of the parking on side streets within like a mile of the beach. Right. So people are parking a really long way away and walking to the beach, and it's crowded up the whole thing. So like, we, we just basically can't, we can only go away from the beach if we want to go on a walk now oh. because it's, it's too, it, there's just too, too many people and people are a little bit rude. Well, like that's, I, I, and I, I get it. Like uh, we're going to have to ease back into this at some point. And we're feeling that easing into it now, of course, some parts of the country more than others, but even going out and having to wait in, you know, a, a spaced out line, you know, for what would normally be like a five minute trip to taking half an hour, I'm feeling that tension yeah. and you can feel it in the line as well. Cause people now that they can go out or now that they feel like they're more comfortable with going out and doing takeout and waiting in lines, there's less of a patience for wanting to get the thing they want. Well, also these local businesses, they have a fifth or a 10th of their workforce, right? So at ritual coffee, they've got two people doing everything. Yeah. 
whereas normally they'd have four to six and it just means that everything takes longer and san francisco is much more on island time if you've ever gone down to the bahamas or to hawaii and you know everyone's kind of doing their own thing uh yeah. that's what it feels like it feels like that in the length of time but yeah that tension is is real the the yeah. hustle the hustle of the city is i i have to imagine is as is, is the first casualty of this whole thing right um one could in, only in, hope <laughs> Well, I, I just mean, wish it, that everyone would wear masks. This is the thing is, and this is, I don't want to like, I have an opinion about the specific types of people I think aren't wearing masks and I won't voice it because it's just my own dumb like bias. But I want to say, if you're listening to this and you're not wearing a mask, you're being kind of a jerk. Like, yeah, we can, we can kill this if all of us wear masks, even if we're moving around the world. And that's incumbent on all of us to do that. Sorry. And yet, they're, like, they're uncomfortable. We know. We wear them all the time. Everybody yeah. listens, I have to imagine everybody who listens to this podcast is wearing a mask because we probably all already had masks. Like, probably. But now I'm seeing half of the people I'm seeing on the street are like, they're like hanging on their face like this. They're basically holding on to them so that they can go into a store and kind of pretend they're wearing a mask and then leave immediately. So I don't remember who said this. I think it was a, an old Gawker writer, uh, 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 Gawker, the company, not Gawker, the site writer, who said, the rule on masks is really simple. You should treat it like the number of people you want to see your butthole. If someone is close enough that they can see, that you wouldn't want them to, you, you would not want to be walking around with your pants down and your cheeks spread because they would see your butthole, you should put, the mask on like that's the use the same rules and then there's no problem because like it's if you're on a hike if you're on a trail you're backpacking you're hiking you're far away from everybody fine pull the mask down you're not totally. gonna hurt me. but as yeah. soon as you see another person boop, put it right back up but yeah. as a society what's the best way i mean i don't think shaming people into wearing masks is going to ever work are um, we a society like <laughs> Good question. That, 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 yes, and we'll, we'll let's let's well, let's assume I, that we, in, we in are. So far as collective choices get made, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. what what are the ways that we can ask people to be more empathetic? Like, what or or is that the angle? You know, to try to convince them that it's not just you know, because, yes, it's uncomfortable. How do you get some someone to do something that's uncomfortable that they may not feel like affects themselves directly, and do it? widespread yeah that's the great challenge of our time right now it's a really good question i mean i'm reading about how there are places like hong kong that are dealing with this really really well even though they never did a lockdown because and i'm not sure if i'm right that it's hong kong it might be a different city but they never did a full shelter in place and yet they flattened the curve because everyone's wearing a mask well and, but like if you look at the places that were affected by SARS 20 years ago, they weathered this a lot better than we have because yep. everybody's used to wearing masks and like masks are part of the culture. And and maybe that'll be a yeah, thing that, you know, once a whole bunch more people die, unfortunately, everyone will kind of come around to that. I think that's the worst way to learn that lesson. I mean, the biggest thing for me that made it really clear is you wear the mask so that you don't infect other people. That's the primary reason you wear it, not to protect. I mean, you also protect yourself. That's a bonus, but you wear it to stop from spreading. It. The yeah. um, it's funny. I watched the first couple of episodes of Watchmen again the other day. Yeah, and how does that feel a, now? Well, I, I mean, I was gonna say there's a ton of dialogue about masks in relation to law because, like, that's the 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 the, the, the people attacking the cops and the cops wearing the masks to protect their identities mm -hmm. is the trigger for the entire. For the entire story as, as right. it unfolds later on right. and and i'm like i think i'm still skeezed out by cops like i'm i'm glad that when i walk around i see cops i'm glad that they're wearing masks but i'm kind of skeezed out by cops wearing masks it's a really uncomfortable conceptually to me that law enforcement is anonymous huh. in right did, did you did you happen to catch the tweet from the prosecutor who said I wore a mask into a bank to do a transaction, and I thought to myself, I have sent people for jail for less than this. Yeah. And he thought he was making a commentary on wearing masks, and everyone in the response line was like, oh, you've made a very important commentary about the American justice system. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, so I saw another one that was like, look, if I, it was somebody who was a, you know, a white guy went to the bank with the mask on, I was like, wow. Oh, 
I don't think I would like this was weird, but fine. And I think that there are a lot of people that this would be weird and dangerous for. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It's a weird, anyway, strange times. Um, I just finished a thing just before the podcast. Uh, this is the epic one day build norm that's been going on for weeks. Um, I'm just going to flash oh it here. God. It is a fully wow. machine base plate for my mini chop saw. Uh, and we're going to, I actually think Norm, this is the one that I, I don't want to try and take the beauty shots of. I want to leave it over at tested. You can swab it down. And I think you should take the beauty shots. Yeah. Up. Yeah. That'd be really fun. It's gorgeous. I can even looking at it just through the zoom window. Oh, I, it is. It's been such an epic. I've never made a useful machine for myself like this. I mean, I just built, finished that that die filer, but like that was a kit, and this was just from whole cloth. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. Well, and you've done stuff like add-ons for your lathe and stuff like that before, but not like a whole big component like this, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, well, one felt like the stepping stone to this by doing the die filer kit and also all the upgrades you've done sense to your, your your existing shop tools at that scale yeah. right then this you, you felt you could tackle that and it's been it's been bigger than you, you the scope isn't bigger than you what you set it out to be well there's this very specific thing that um i talked about in the uh in the lathe chuck video which we'll we're cutting now and we'll go up in a while um in that having a consciousness about things that weigh like five to twenty pounds and their concentricity within a few thousandths of an inch, which is actually of real concern when you're using these machines and, and trying to get accurate. Um, I had a funny thing this morning. So I have a three jaw chuck, which was my main bread and butter chuck in a lathe. And I took it apart last week and put it back together and filmed the process and talked about it. Uh, and when I put it back together, I put the micrometer on it and I was getting run out of about eight thousandths on it which is a lot, that's like three sheets of paper. Uh, and again, this is a big 20 pound chuck, but 8,000, you can get better than that. Standard on these is about 4,000, right? Like three to four is considered acceptable and like good enough for a three jaw chuck. So this weekend I thought about it and I was like, oh, I'm gonna remachine the adapter plate from the cam spindle lock to the, lathe, to the lathe chuck and I'm gonna make it adjustable and I'm gonna dial it all in. Because I had it at, I, I managed through a bunch of trial and error and testing to get it to about four thou. About four How do you identify it? How do you diagnose and find where your slop is? Well, so what you do is you put the lathe in and you see if you've got run out. Then you try different size objects because sometimes run out happens to a certain what? size that you're commonly clamping and wearing the clamps out on. What's mm. run out, Adam? Run out is a lack of concentricity. Okay. So if it's if there's zero run out when you put something in the lathe, it runs perfectly true. If there's any run out at all, when you rechuck it back, you're not going to be in the same position you were the first time. Okay. And there are certain things for which this is super important. So I came in this morning ready to remachine and do all this stuff just to buy myself this extra like four thousandths of an inch, three thousandths of an inch. And then I looked at the gauge I was using, which is this little little lever gauge that just you know you touch on the thing that you're spinning and it tells you how much it's moving and i it had been moving uh four and a half tick marks mm. well this morning i discovered because it was the first time i'd actually read my gauge that the gauge wasn't reading thousands it was reading half thousands oh <laughs> so you were fine you were at five <laughs> I was within two and a half thousands. I'm like, damn, I'm below the stated minimum on this. So I just, I wrapped it and I can go. Oh, All right. Save um, you a bunch I, of work. A friend of Tested, Tom Lipton, who built one of the beautiful, most beautiful parts for the uh, uh, Apollo hatch last summer, uh, gave me some counsel over the phone this weekend. Um, and he's got a very, uh, um, uh, he's got a real, old school make it work mentality, right? Like you ask him, what's the best chuck I could buy? And he's like, yeah, you could spend any amount of money you want, but here's the one, here's the thing is, here's the way to think about it. And it's a much more sort of like make work what you've got because thousands of dollars only buys you a couple of thousands of an inch of accuracy, you know? And that's the hard part of make, about making any type of purchasing recommendation. You have to know the person asking the question as much as, you know, 
to really know what they need and Indeed. sometimes know what they what they're really asking for right <laughs> yeah, the, the, the what they're really asking for is the hard part right because like yeah. uh, like we, you see this it's funny we get this on tech pod emails a lot and somebody's like hey I, you know, I have this thing and it does exactly what I need. And you get that from the first three sentences, but they're like, but there's this other one out there that's, that's a little bit better. And I should, should I spend $3,000 and get rid of this old thing that's been perfect for it? Can, it happens in cameras too, Norm. I, you know, like yeah, this happens yeah, in all the, all, all of the places where there's, where there's product density, you can, you can go crazy. Yeah. And it's what, what are the, and the increments, you spend more time on the last 1% of accuracy than on the first 98%. Right. And, yeah. and that's not also more money. Yes. Yeah. And that's not to discount the like personal value or utility in that last 1% or in the perceived value because perceived value is a form of value, right? It's just knowing who, who's making the ask. If the person right. making the ask is the type of person that really, that's what they want. They want to pay the extra because they get a lot from that part of it. Then that might be right. Oh, yeah. Well, no, but, look, I, it's like, it's, I mean, very specifically for all the obvious reasons, I'm not looking to spend money right now. Um, yeah. But I can certainly see a point in the future where a windfall came in and I thought to myself, I am going to go buy the Cadillac of Chucks. Uh, and I'm going to love that thing till the end of my days. You know, that is that type of pleasure of augmenting and upgrading your stuff is a deep and abiding pleasure. And it's really like I've pursued it at many points in my life. Just not right now. <laughs> well, but, but I mean, the thing that, the thing that's interesting about what happened to you is you were looking at a, at what you perceived as, as a number and you're like, this number is not where that number should be. So rather than identifying a problem when you were using the tool, like, yeah. like, yep, like totally you were right. like the number and, and, and it's a, it is an easy thing to do. I'm glad it happens to you too. I always thought that was just me and and uh, yeah, everyone else. So. Oh well, in fact, and I was totally aware of it, but I was also curious about my ability to eliminate the. Oh, of course, right? Like the 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 sheer the sheer uh, uh, there's a sheer pleasure for me in the mental exercise of thinking about something that weighs twenty pounds and how to get it. Three thousandths, one sheet of paper more centered on a lathe spindle. Like that's real pleasure to me. Uh, oh yeah, you know. Well, and it's, it's totally it's, new. It's it's not it's not a frame I have I have lived within uh, up till now as a maker. It's it's for for me. There's a thing. There's two things that happen. One is I just conceptually don't like it when things that should work don't work. Right yeah. when they're not working right, it it makes me like neurotic and crazy in a way that very few things do at this point. I'm right there. Um, but the other thing is the, the the inverse of that is that when it's working right and you don't have to think about it, it's so good. Like you're just like, this is as good as it can be. That feels so, so good. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and of all the things that we don't have control of in the world right now, this also feels like something that in your space you can have control over. Yeah. 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 Um, also doing this accuracy and watching all these videos of different machinists executing different builds, um, I am starting to see the little pieces of equipment I never understood how they could be useful before. And now I am. For instance, there's a piece of machinist equipment called a sign bar, which, uh, which is basically two rollers with a flat bar that's perfectly parallel to the bottom of the rollers. And when you want to make an angle, you, uh, you look up a chart for the size sign bar you have, and it tells you exactly how many gauge blocks to stack underneath one of the rollers, and you will get this crazy accurate angle. Wow. And there's no other protractor or anything that will give you such an accurate, uh, 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 such an accurate angle as a sign bar. And I've never understood them. I've known about them for years, but I've never really gotten them. And now I'm like, Oh yeah, gotta. I need a sign bar now. <laughs> um, one thing to shift gears, I want to talk about yep. is I know we we love the Mandalorian. We've talked about yep. on the podcast how much we really love the show, and it's on Disney Plus. And for people who may not know, there's a, like a compendium show that Disney has started releasing week by week. They're calling it no, Disney Gallery, really? uh, the Mandalorian. So it's their their own in house behind the scenes series. It's called Disney Gallery, so I presume they're going to do the same thing for like the MCU shows when those yeah. eventually come out. But this is in lieu of having a director's commentary for the TV show, which I would love 
as well. It's, Love a Favreau commentary. Yeah, it's Favreau and Dave Filoni uh, basically doing roundtables with the other directors as well as the creative team for The Mandalorian. So it's basically dinner for five. Oh right? my it's Favreau's God. dinner for that five, like but so Star Wars. So much pleasure. Oh my God. Yeah. But what's really I'll interesting- i check that out. I mean, it's- it's 100 percent it's a mark it's a marketing tool right it's like yeah, of course, yeah. it's it's helping promote the show it's for people already bought in you know it's for for us who love the show and want a little bit more more mm-hmm. of it but it's also interesting because i can there's like a they never mention the new trilogy right there's this almost elephant in the room and i i'm watching this behind the scenes behind the scenes series and the first one is about the director so they have uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, there's Taika Waititi, who's, you know, obviously in the yeah. Disney family with Thor Ragnarok, mm-hmm. um, uh, Deborah Chow, and uh, one other director uh, who, do, who did the, and it's clear that they're trying to set up that this is like, for the Mandalorian, the new, like, creative force, and right. it's diverse, right. and, they're, and, they, and they're allowed to tell their own stories and bring their experiences as actors or action directors or comedy writers like Taika to Star Wars, and it's very much projecting this Star Wars is safe, the future of Star Wars and the legacy that what we love from the original trilogy and, and the, even the prequel trilogy is now being shepherded into this new generation with this new creative team. And it's it's really like it's fun because they're all come from different very different backgrounds and it's yeah. all shepherded oh. by um, Favreau and Dave Filoni. Have you ever met Dave Filoni? Adam? I have not. I have not. We know people who 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 know him and we haven't yeah. met him. But the thing that gets across so well is that Dave Filoni is like he's a hardcore Star Wars fan. He is like yeah. he is the guy whose dream job. He knows more about Star Wars than he's like Star Wars fan first, then writer director oh, and that's great that's great he tells this story about when he was first working on like uh, avatar the last airbender and like nickelodeon and mm-hmm. lucasfilm called him up under the recommendation of george lucas and he thought it was a joke to work on the clone wars or the animated show that he ended up you know show running and running and and being the head producer on and he didn't came in for an interview with george lucas and he was like a super fan who got to pick George Lucas's brain about, did you, this is what, what you meant when you wrote this in the prequels and when you wrote this in the original trilogy. <laughs> and he didn't think he was going to get the job. And the, the prevailing thing top of his mind, he says, was he knew he was never going to speak to George Lucas again. This was his 10 minutes right, of right. FaceTime at the ranch again interview. He was going to then go back. But he knew when the next Star Wars movie, when Revenge of the Sith would come out, and when he was waiting in line, he would have the best, story to tell the other people waiting in line. <laughs> uh, I, I, and that yeah. that's, was wow. what it, top that's of his great. mind. And that, that tells you everything great. we know about like, he's one of us. That's yeah. Cool. I, I, I have been watching, so I found a list someplace and I'll dig it up and send you the link if, if you want to share it, Norm. But it's like the, the here are the 20 or 50 or something Clone Wars episodes you should watch. Cause there's, there's a lot of Clone Wars. I, I powered through Rebels really fast, which was like, it, I was blown away by Rebels. Like it is an astounding animated series. Uh, the stuff that I've seen with the Clone Wars, it's like it's all over the place, and there's so much of it. It's hard for me to watch, you know, six or seven seasons or whatever. But but what this list has pushed me to has been so much fun and so good. And it's the things that I liked about Star Wars when I was a kid. It's the things I still like about Star Wars as an adult. And it's it's just it's just really really delightful and really well done and and it's on disney plus so i've been i, I didn't realize feloni was uh avatar the last airbender he was not, not a creator but an animator right. on the show yeah okay so when we were down in new zealand richard taylor and a bunch of the weta folks johnny fraser allen sung the praises of that show and i watched um i think i'm midway through season three now um it's terrific it's really really yeah. fun and it's a beautiful show and um, I, I think there are a lot of probably similarities in that these they're fantasy stories where we yeah. think of Star Wars not necessarily science fiction but a fantasy. But oh. both Avatar and Star Wars have these kind of universal truths and tell a hero a traditional hero's journey um, that's very resonant. And it made me think about you know obviously under Disney you have the MCU and you have Star Wars and they're both billion dollar franchise machines yeah. and they have a you know a shared audience at least in the United States. But why is it that fans what is it that separates like the expectations between an mcu movie like an avengers movie 
and a next Star Wars movie? And why are they maybe held to different standards or why, and, and as fans, why do you, why do we weigh them different? I have, I have, I'll, I'll yeah, share but I, mean, my... I think there's, there's so much more to it than just the fan response. There's also the institutional inertia of the decision-making process, because I think it's pretty cool. I mean, of course, Kathleen Kennedy and her team, John Nolan, all those wonderful people at Lucasfilm have a procedure that they've been doing and working with each other and to great success for decades. And the same thing is true with Kevin Feige and his whole team. Right. But they're, they're not the same at all, right? Like all of the ways in which, they, I, it's just hard to imagine a Star Wars universe that would let a movie like Ragnarok happen and yet I am really hopeful now that they're all under the Disney banner that that might occur. And what you say about the, about the behind the scenes stuff is really exciting to me. That but in the same vein, I think there are fans that don't want that too, that I've heard directly <laughs> from fans who say a Ragnarok style, a comedy in Star Wars is not what I want. And they hold it on a different pedestal. You know, what's really funny. Here's the thing about that argument is I'm not saying it should be like Ragnarok. I'm saying something as Ragnarok is a, is a narrative weird left turn in a way that's as we know, abiding and delightful. I don't, I don't have to see a Star Wars comedy. I just mean a unique director's unique vision for a franchise that I love that takes it in a direction I didn't expect. Well, mm. so there's there's two things, right? One is that the Star Wars fandom is a lot older than, I, I mean, I realize that Marvel has been around for a really long time, but Marvel as a massive cultural phenomenon that goes outside of comic books is relatively, you know, it's 10, 10 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, Star Wars has been around for 40 years and they have now three fully distinct generations of fans of those films. Yeah. The original trilogy people, the people that came 20 years later with the prequels and then the people that came 20 years after that with the with the with the with the new movies. Um plus all the other stuff in between. But but I mean on on this current run of Star Wars films, the big thing is that they aren't like the MCU is releasing two or three movies a year and they can afford to take chances like putting giving the guy who made Hunt for the Wilder People, a, a Thor movie to make, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when the Star Wars, you know, they, they took some chances with this, with the the I can't remember what they called the uh, anthology stories, the sure. you know the Solo and the and the mm -hmm. and Rogue One, but those mainline movies were so are so big and so important. I feel like they they weren't able to take. You know, they couldn't even take like a like a no, I, civil I totally war, agree. Yeah. yeah, or or a Winter Soldier type risk with them. So it's it's yeah, I don't know. I I I'm hopeful that the TV stuff will give them those smaller stakes opportunities to expand. Well, uh, here's the thing: I would never want to have to weigh and make the decisions that people like Kevin Feige and Kathleen Kennedy have to make. Yeah. They are. <laughs> the stakes are, I mean, the stakes are really high monetarily and from your employment standpoint, and they serve so many different masters. Uh, it is, it's amazing to me that a machine that gigantic can do marvelous magical things after mm. a period of time, you know? Do yeah. you think MC mo MCU movies are, because their origins are in the comic books, they're less, for lack of a better word, mythic and universal and... Uh you know, they're, they are, you know, it's capes and, yeah. and costumes and yes, there's world building and yes, it's this universe that they're fleshing out. But, you know, one of the reasons I think people love the first Iron Man was because, you know, it's, it's a great story and a great performance, but it's also realized on screen for the first time after decades, this character that people had only experienced through the medium of comic books and it kind of built up in their heads, whereas Star Wars, it started off as film. Yeah. yeah. I think it's so hard to, 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 to take any broad conclusions from it, right? Because so much of it stems from the magic of the first Iron Man, from the co-mingling of Robert Downey Jr.'s character and his actual public persona and his character, right? And I feel like that magic and the match that they lit with that film informs a lot of how they then went and executed the MCU. And in there also, Nolan's Dark Knight series changed another aspect of what we thought was possible with, with superhero films. I mean, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's funny, what, like for, for comics, for, an ad, for MCU being an adaptation of comics, comics are famously uh, unchanging. Right, you, you know, Superman never ages. They they reboot. You know, right. you rarely get 
and and they do like the the whole big you know universe reboot but essentially they're all kind of stuck like they don't get old and what the mcu did that was so surprising is they did have people die have people change it was a reality of them working with actors on contracts right yeah, the end yeah. of end game was world shifting with the character it wasn't just a, a reset button as it so often is the case and i was very surprised and delighted for that and star wars is a place where i think some of the disappointments at least i had with you know rise of skywalker at the end was that it did end up being a a resetting of things being nothing really changed right there the right, falcon right. is still there you know it's and Chewbacca nothing's changed in the rules of the universe yeah 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 the, i mean the the thing about the mcu is that even even when like when they take a a, a comic storyline whether it's uh, world uh, planet hulk or or uh, the I, warren ellis's extremist stuff and sure. they like take the bits and pieces they cherry pick the little bits of that story out and put it into a movie as a as a fan of like Warren Ellis's extremist line, I was really stoked, even though it wasn't the story from the comic book, I was stoked to see that reference in Iron Man 3, or I was stoked to see the, the Planet Hulk stuff in like the tiny, tiny, tiny slice of that that came up in Ragnarok. And, and it was gratifying. Whereas like, and if you contrast that with the reaction that people had when, when Luke Skywalker was a used up shell of a man in Last Jedi, like people were pissed about that. And, and like, people feel very strongly about those characters in a way that I, as somebody who thought he felt very strongly about those characters, I was surprised by. Um, uh, I'm going to go off on a tangent here Please. and tell you, I forgot, I keep forgetting to let you guys know, I finished Westworld this week. Oh. I finished the last, done. the season finale of season three. Um, and meanwhile, my mom has been watching West Wing. So I keep getting them mixed up in my head. And so I tell my wife, I'm going to go downstairs and watch some West Wing World Wing World. Wait, Bartlett was a Cylon? <laughs> so remember a couple weeks ago uh, when you were still in season two, right, Adam? I asked yeah. how important was the Western setting yeah. and the in be, being in the park, how important was that to you for the West World experience? And you know, it's not a big spoiler. We won't spoil the whole plot for you, Will, but you know, season three takes place not in Westworld. Yeah. And did you felt feel that that was, that took away from the th parts of what you enjoyed of the show, the first few seasons? No, no, it didn't. I, I, look, I think the show is, it's a little inconsistent, but I mean, you know, that that's par for the course. Um, weirdly, I think I'm in a in a smaller camp than most people. I think season two is my favorite season. Mm. Um, I really liked how far it wandered, um, but I loved I loved Evan Rachel Wood and the whole kind of epic forces aligning that season three represents. I really. I think they did it. Was all their exterior shooting in Singapore? Most of it, yeah. I think yeah. Ger Berlin or Germany or maybe it was. It was definitely they had, you know, false LA and false San Francisco and yeah. using the architecture of uh, Singapore and uh, was, was part of it. Their vision of the future, which was undefined how far into the future you were looking, but my guess is somewhere around 50 to 80 years, um, was fascinating and really lovely. I really enjoyed that. Um, I found it meaty and delicious all the way through. So does, does that mean Anthony Hopkins is Norm's age? <laughs> Some, something like that yeah, yeah. i think you're some, i think you're not anthony hopkins is a millennial probably right absolutely absolutely the man and the man in black is one of norm's children yeah, yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> that was the i i also i completely agree with you the it, it being taken to a place where it represented their interpretation of the future from a production design standpoint and an effect standpoint like that was real fun world building to see on a you know hbo budget Right, Absolutely. that normally and and different than what we'd seen from a Blade Runner or 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 other far future sci fi stories, uh, but what and it was a very more plot driven, like a lot more stuff happened. I I think yeah, in yeah. season three, but what I missed was Anthony Hopkins. I missed the monologues. Yeah. Hopkins acting in the is is one of the best things about the first season. Is his measured, incredible beat by beat performance. Totally, uh, he's I, missed. I, I, I went back after watching, so I'm, I just finished season one and I went back and watched the episode with Bernard. The, with, I don't want to spoil anything for people who haven't watched, but the Bernard yeah. reveal. 
and the model, the, the, the Hopkins performance in that episode is astounding. Like he, he's both that and the, and the, the time when he's sitting with the, with the other, with the woman who is Bernard's. The French woman. Equal. Yes. Yeah. In the, in the restaurant, those two scenes are just absolutely astounding and unlike anything I think I've seen on TV since maybe probably since Jean Smart actually in Watchmen when I think about it, but oh, God, I love her. Uh, Westworld. I think they've announced that they're going to do for sure another season and maybe up to six seasons. So definitely is a full arc. They want to tell uh, Westworld well, Westworld. Yep. And it'll wow, be wow, really. Yeah. So it'll be uh, two more years before the next season. Um, but you know, judging by the way you saw season three, ending and after that there is a post credit scene will if just to let okay. you know okay uh it, it wait there's a on post season one or season three season three's ending yes did you not know that no oh, i got well. some homework to do <laughs> oh boy um also yeah. can who's what is the name of the actor that plays serac oh he's the the guy in oceans 12 right the the um isn't the box he also, guy? isn't he also the choreographer from black swan yes he is he he plays the hard-ass french dude so always the, yes. i have to say there have been movies in which i think he might have been poorly directed because i i didn't think i didn't think a lot of the performance he gave in black swan i just didn't feel a lot of character uh in that role um but he's terrific in westworld he's really yeah. he's, he's really wonderful Vincent Castle, and I think he brings Vincent the Castle, acting uh, gravitas um, that kind of replaces Hopkins uh, for for season three. The monologue. Yeah. He has a he has a it's a difficult role to play, and and be scary, and he manages it. He does it, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The the Gene Smart thing is a Mike Schur production, just FYI, you know, All from right. up up there. Um, um, is there a movie you guys want to watch? to do a spoiler cast in the coming huh. weeks you and know what? I, I think what we're going to watch tonight with my mom because she hasn't seen my mom is um almost totally ignorant of the mcu Ooh. um so we might have some work to do but we're going to show her captain marvel tonight you should get her to rank them just to get show her all <laughs> all 25 movies and put them in order from best to worst that is a that's a tough thing to do to an 85 year old broad come on that's a tough thing to do to, we've been threatening to do it for four years now or something i don't know it's yeah no um, it's um but we're going to start with Captain Marvel, and then uh, we're going to go from there. Um, and I've also been feeling lately like it's been too long since I've watched the last hour of Endgame, which has been something I I've watched the last hour of Endgame I think seven or eight times now. Where, does that does that last hour start when Hulk does the snap? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That it's a, it's an incredible. The fact that you can tell what's going on in that chaos remains Dude, amazing. The more I watch it, the more astounded I am by what the Russos were able to achieve. It is like a Mozart symphony in which you never don't hear the oboe. Well, the, because... and <laughs> you know, you, we can, we can, as fan films or film fans, we uh, can backseat, direct, and and kind of cut these movies apart and take them apart, right? As we've done in this podcast. But if you watch the deleted scenes, like there are mm. some great deleted scenes uh, uh, on Disney Plus. You can watch even for Endgame. Yep, and yep. Alternate, so many of them. Alternate, alternate Black takes, Widow deaths, <laughs> and like creatively, all of them look great to me. To be able to then in the process, in the chaos of filmmaking, have a vision to make a choice and say, no, this isn't working. And then find something that ultimately, obviously worked and stick that, that is, I, I can't even imagine what no. it takes. It's funny that you mentioned that because I think the same thing. When I watch an alternate scene and I see how much work everyone did to make that scene work and the actors and the post-production and everything and somebody watched it and they're like, ah. Oh, we're all agreeing. It's just not quite there. Okay, let's rewrite four scenes and make them all redo it. If that's that's. Can you imagine the responsibility? Well, or even and, just and, sitting and, in the editing room, right? Like sitting in the editing room, and you're like, you have these four takes. All four of them, I watched, and I'm like, these are incredible. Like, there's nothing. The yeah. all of these would land in slightly different ways, and and the, you know, yeah, like the, so, the yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna tease here. Uh, I'm going to tease here. Uh, I spent uh, a, a week on a large franchise production that's been pushed back. Otherwise, I'd be able to say what it is. Um, and I got to watch a great director work with two great actors doing 12 takes of a scene. 
and it took them about three hours. And in the course of that scene, the first take I thought was freaking fine, just great. And the last take was world breaking. Like the everybody found seven new things to imbue that scene with over the course of 12 takes with the director making small, tr tr uh, small changes and the actors making minor and major shifts and also in the rhythm with each other. Um, it was beautiful and it really made it clear, it made it clear that the kind of, that, that how difficult that job is as a director. Yeah. To to take these elements and make the stew of a film, you know, both in like, the moment, you know, yeah. and in the edit, yeah. and then also it requires trust, honestly, right, to be open with the collaborators because it's a very easy situation where everyone just says yes or defers to you, and people make the easy choice, and that, that's the hard choices that make great products. Well, and then you watch the actors also trying slightly different things each time and that there really is a magic. Sidney Lumet used to famously not watch the video tap. He would just listen because in his opinion, he could tell if a scene was working by the, by the rhythm of the actors mm. talking to each other. Yeah, and I, and it, I really get that, right? You really see something like that when you're watching, watching multiple takes of the same scene. And that's, I'll go back to that Disney uh, behind the scenes of The Mandalorian, you know, as the directors, as Taika Waititi and, and De uh, Bryce Dallas Howard talked about their approaches. One of the things that uh, Bryce Dallas Howard said was she was the newbie in production. She did the episode that was um, the one where the, the alien planet get invaded by the at, -AT and they have to mm -hmm. kind of- Yeah, 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 end, the, right? yeah. The Seven Samurai. And seven, exactly. And she, the, her approach as a new director was to, to watch the takes and to make sure every scene, like a play, could stand on its own regardless of where you cut. And if the whole scene, if the whole four minute conversation worked and worked great, and, and then you cut from there, then you're gonna get something great. That's a great, hmm. it's lovely. You're reminding me that I, uh, one of the things Sigourney Weaver said she got out of making Alien, um, which was her first film, <laughs> was you can't, she said, I realized I can't worry about the full arc of the film's narrative. I have to play each scene in and of itself for the scene. I, the director's job is to make it all work together. My job is to make each scene work. And mm. again, that's like that, that level of consciousness about how each of these pieces fits together is really, is really amazing to watch happen. I love that we live in an age where we get so much granularity from the creatives in this process about how it works for them. There's, there's, um, we've talked about this movie a lot in the podcast, but there's a, there's a moment in the still untitled commentary for, I think the extended, the one that's actually called, uh, sorry, the almost famous uh, box set that's that's called Still Untitled that has all the extended stuff. And it's Cameron Crowe talking to Francis McDormand and I think his mom, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe he's talking to his mom and they're talking about Francis McDormand. But but the, he has this lovely conversation about how he was trying to get, like how he got the performance he wanted. He was trying to get the performance he wanted out of Francis McDormand. And then he realized he needed to get the performance Francis McDormand wanted onto film and it, it anyway it's good you should listen to that commentary <laughs> together, that's one of my all-time favorite movies I love it. have you watched the um the stairway to heaven scene in that film no well no okay I know we're almost wrapped to here but I got to tell you this um in the original script of almost famous um Patrick Fugit wants to show his mom Francis McDormand that music that rock music can be transcendent right so he sits her down in the living room. And as the scene was written by Crow, he sits her in the living room, puts Stairway to Heaven on the record player, and they listen to it in its entirety while looking at each other. Wow. And wow. that was the scene, seven minutes of that scene. And Cameron <laughs> Crow, he said he wrote 50 some odd drafts of that script and that scene never left the script. It was, his, it was for him this anchor point and the relationship between those two. And once he cut the movie together, he realized he had to chuck it. Yeah. And it's getting so, rid yeah. of it was one of the hardest things he did. But in the oh. DVD of Almost Famous, he includes the scene, but of course he doesn't have the rights to put Stairway to Heaven on the DVD. <laughs> so what they tell you to do is line up your CD player and 
<laughs> press play right here and you get to watch the scene play out with you supplying the music and it is mwah, it's it's wonderful and you also get why it doesn't work in the film wow That's right awesome. does that happen after 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 um his sister leaves it has to right uh, it's, it's when I, he's it's when it's pressed patrick fugit not young william uh yes that's correct okay that's yeah, correct yeah, yeah. huh um, it's been a long time since I need to watch that again. It's a fabulous film. Yeah, it's true. I, I, it's true. We should watch it again. I agree. Right. Maybe Sounds we should like do we that. Got homework. You want to do that one? Um, you know what I love about Crow uh, is how much he really, really workshopped the films of his we really love. Jerry Maguire famously went through over 50 drafts with James L. Brooks, I think, if I remember correctly, acting as a consigliere on the, on the script writing process. And Almost Famous also was really, really workshopped. And uh, like, let's, we could watch Almost Famous and try and watch as much behind the scenes material as we can get our hands on and really just, and talk about that whole process. I, I would, well, let's discuss offline. All right, all right. <laughs> um, uh, the the thing that the, his yeah his commentaries are very good. That's all I'll say. Anyway, yeah, um, I think this, this, you might as well wrap it up. Yeah, that's I think a good so. voice. Norm, 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 Norm's, Norm's giving me the stop talking. Will look. <laughs> we we will issue our homework uh, on social media after yep. we've discussed it. Uh, but it's good to see you guys. Yeah, you can see what you're building, Adam. Uh, hope everyone stays safe. Uh, last shout out. Um, our friend Max at Lunar Replicas sent oh, us yes. um, oh, nice. some face masks, and you can get them. They're very nicely designed, and this is the same material, I believe, as the NASA jacket. It is, uh, a fine, it is a fine cotton blend. It's beautiful, and it's soft. They're gorgeous. They're fantastic masks. has a pocket for filter. Oh, for, for so a filter. Awesome. That's what I'm using. You know, support people, support small businesses making masks, and wear a mask. Absolutely. Please. Wear a mask. Wear your mask. All right. All right. Um, see you guys, we'll see next, you guys week. next time. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.